Good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're just going to give it a couple of minutes till 10 o'clock. Fran, what's that painting behind you or that that picture? It's small. Hard to see. I know the yeah, other. Yeah. I know the other one very well. This one, the yeah, blue one. one, the yeah. blue one. So that's so so that's George Washington on a horse, and it says and it says first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his country. And so it kind of like uh, the little setup that I have kind of frames my thoughts on like leadership. And so you have like. You know, it, it's it's about like the warrior diplomat, you know, aspect uh, about, you know, you've got to be you, you have to you have to be able to get along with everyone. You have to build relationships. You have to know when to push and drive things. Um, and you have to and sometimes always... on Christmas Day, you got to load up a boat full of people and cross hey. the freezing cold river to go kill the enemy. Got if, it. If that's what it takes. <laughs> <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I find that to be motivating every once in a while. <laughs> and what's the thing up top? That, uh, uh, that's my, so um, I rode crew at Boston University in college. Yeah. So that's the oar. When you graduate, you know, if you were on the team, you know, all four years, you know, they give you this, this oar. So that's my oar um, from BU. Sweet. And then the, and then as you know, the special forces crest to consistently remind me of the the character and values that I need to display. <laughs> I like your setup. You I'm in the I'm in the high speed uh, the high speed kitchen conference room. It's awesome. I love it. <laughs> Is that it's a weird thing I do? I actually, yeah, this had scars, so the sewing machines are out front. But I actually, yeah. like, you go to a restaurant or you go to anywhere, and it's like, what, what does the what does the bathroom look like, <laughs> right? Is it a terrible, dirty thing that is very uninviting, or do they have cool posters in it, or something? You know, so like like the best place to advertise to a dude ever is above the urinal. Like, if you don't have that and you're a business, you're missing out hugely. Like, why would you never not do that? I don't get it. And like, so this is where I make my peanut butter and jelly sandwiches at lunchtime, right? And it's like, of course, I want to look at Elvis Presley when, when he enlisted into the army. Of course, like good fellows carry some good lessons. Some of them what not to do, some of them not, not how not to be. But there's actually true loyalty in there. If you dig around hard, like, you know, love, love is the greatest thing ever. You got, you know, Romeo and Juliet there. Don't forget that stuff. And you got all these old school, uh, you'll recognize some of this, Fran. Like all the, I, I got that at, brag as well like all the, the flashes uh, yeah all the flashes and then you know my yeah. grandfather was in korea and in, in the artillery so that's kind of that that poster magically appeared one day as you go artillery my grandfather awesome um so th those so. of you that are getting on early are getting a full preview of a lot of really cool and interesting information about our two fantastic guests today i'm christina polito i'm the founding principal of compass workforce solutions and I have to say, this is kind of like a day that is going to go down in my calendar as one of the epic days of my life, where I get to hang out with two super cool human beings, Fran Ricciopi and Jason McCarthy. And we're going to be talking about what is it like to lead with agility. So a couple housekeeping items before we get started. We are recording the webinar today. So if you are a registered attendee, you will get a copy of the recording. There are no slides. We're not killing anyone with PowerPoint this morning. We're gonna ask you to pay attention and engage, and we're gonna have an interactive dialogue. And I'm gonna be um, asking Fran and Jason some really powerful questions about leadership. You're all muted. If you have questions, you can put them in the chat box. If we don't have time to get to your questions during the webinar, you're gonna get a follow-up email with how to contact each of us. And I'll also save the questions and try to get them addressed um, in that same type of a format. So welcome again, I'm Christina Polito, the founding principal of Compass Workforce Solutions. Compass is an award-winning human resource consulting firm that's dedicated 
meeting the needs of small and medium-sized businesses. There's four things that we do. Our work is focused on four areas of human resources that allow businesses to be profitable, scale, and be sold or transitioned at a higher evaluation. We focus on compliance, operational controls, resolving workplace conflict, and we are certified partners with Predictive Index, which means we focus on talent optimization, helping employees, employers, and teams optimize their talent. So talent optimization is built on the premise that employees can thrive when they're put in roles that play to their strengths and leverage their strongest behavioral tendencies. We also believe that skills can be taught. So if you hire the right people based on heart and mindset and learning agility, they can be trained to do what you need them to do. Our service area is focused on the tri-state, but our work is also national in scope as we handle HR needs wherever our clients have operations, including California, Florida, Georgia, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Washington. So I want to send a huge welcome to Fran Richopi and Jason McCarthy. It's really an honor and a privilege to have you both with us here today. First of all, I want to thank you for your service to our country. It means a lot to me. It's what allows me to do what I do every day with tremendous freedom. So in putting together this webinar, I was kind of inspired by two specific uh, sources. One was the 2022 CEO benchmark report that Predictive Index puts out, a survey of over 2,000 executives on what's forefront on their mind and what's critical in business. And then the Fast Company article, Seven Ways That HR Will Look Different in 2023 by Lars Schmidt. There were two particular themes that stood out to me, and I think I reflected every day, and I see it every day in the work that we do with our clients. That was agility, learning agility and leading agility, the ability to move quickly and easily, the ability to think and understand quickly, adapt quickly, change, update, and repeat. The definition of success over the last three years for business has been a constant moving target and often changes week to week. The ability for leaders and teams to think, observe, adapt, respond, and learn quickly is no longer an option. Uncertainty necessitates agility. And as the uncertainty continues in our economy and the priority to attract and retain our top talent, there's an imperative that businesses understand how to be agile, flexible, and adaptable. So we're gonna focus on today, what does it mean and look like to lead and manage with agility, the necessity of learning agility in the workforce, and why a focus on high performing teams versus individual performers is really a best practice and leads to greater business success. So as a PI practitioner, we gain tremendous insights into people's capabilities, behaviors, and their learning agility through the use of the Predictive Index tool suite. So these two themes really hit me as critical for success. And Fran is a client of Compass. Fran uses Predictive Index in his work with one of his clients' analytics. So I reached out to Fran based on that and also based on the fact that Fran is a Green Beret and an entrepreneur. And I said, let's do this. Let's bring some value to the people. And Fran said, fantastic. Let me call my friend Jason. So that's how we all got together today to be able to share this insight and wisdom with you. So Fran and Jason, both of you embody agility as people who signed up for the military right after September 11th and not only served your country, but achieved the status of Army Green Beret Special Forces Operations. And then if that's not enough, you go on to become amazingly successful entrepreneurs. You start businesses where you're leading teams and you're developing community. So I'm gonna ask each of you to introduce yourselves and share a little bit about this amazing journey that you've had. So Fran, why don't you go first? 
Hi, th thanks every, everyone. Thanks for joining and thanks Christine for a very warm welcome. My name is Fran Ruchobi. Um, So basically for me, it was pretty simple. I had a choice. I 9-11 uh, was my junior year in college and I spent, I was a journalism major studying broadcast journalism. And in 2003, I was going to go to uh, somewhere in the middle of uh, middle America and be a weatherman and a traffic reporter, or I was going to go into the army and do what I thought was, would make a difference in the world. And I said, maybe one day later on, I'll become a traffic reporter. That door will always be open. And so I, I took the, took the leap and I went into the army and I spent a couple of years in the infantry. And then when my window opened to go to special forces, uh, that's when I went to selection and was fortunately selected and spent the rest of my career as a green beret, uh, serving a 10 special forces group. And so Got out in 2016, got my MBA because I didn't because then I had to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up. So I applied and went to NYU. And then I had a lot of different opportunities to do some pretty cool things. I worked at Merrill Lynch as a financial advisor, realized it wasn't for me. Um, I would, I led security as the chief security officer at Snapchat. I was the CEO of a private equity portfolio company. And now I, throughout all of that, built a, a leadership development program. And now all of my effort has been gone into building leadership development programs, building, working with teams and individuals. And about two years ago, I started the Jedberg podcast, where I tell the stories of elite performers through the lens of special operations and the character and components of a performance mindset that are used by special operations command to recruit and develop and assess high performing talent to set the conditions for success in anything that you do. And so it doesn't matter in my mind, if you're building a company, if you're building a sports team, if you're an athlete, if you're trying to better yourself, if you're trying to better your team, your organization, if you're a politician, a journalist, if you're um, you know, a small business owner, whatever you are, character sits at the center of everything that we do. We have people, are, the special operations forces, truth number one is people are more important than hardware. And I fundamentally believe that. And that is where my focus has been over the last couple of years is how do we develop the highest performing talent, not only as individuals, but also as teams, because that's what builds great sustainable organizations. So that's me. Jason, all right, I'm up. This has all been, this has already been worth it to, uh, Fran might have earned himself a new call, a new call sign, like weatherman. <laughs> Right, <laughs> how, these things, how these things happen. Um, Best job in a newsroom. <laughs> but uh, you know, my inspiration was the same. I, I graduated from college in May of 2001 and really didn't know what I wanted to do. The, the theme might be agility in this, but at times it felt like I was a I was the anchor at the bottom of a boat, and I didn't even understand what the boat was doing or where it was supposed to go. And so, you know, in in the process of trying to find some. Uh, some courage to do what I to do what I knew I needed to do, which was join the military. You know, I spent some time at a, a call center and a marketing firm. I spent some time at a at a merchant bank in Washington D.C., where, you know, I made thirty grand a year and slept on the floor of the place like three or four nights a, a week because it was you know there was a lot of demands on on me with twenty senior senior vice presidents and, and two analysts and you know it's it, it led the path of choosing a harder path that I knew I needed to do it led to other harder things. And while I can connect a lot of dots for you and talk about, yeah, you know, special forces and that career and five years only, by the way, um, you know, so a stint in, in Iraq and in Africa and a little bit of time in Europe, same special forces group as Fran, 10th group. And, um, you know, it kind of accidentally led to building a, a rucksack based on some of the rucksacks that we had in special forces. And I built it for my wife, who was a case officer in the CIA. And we were in West Africa and, you know, it was a go bag patterned after a go ruck and nobody wanted to buy it after years of every dollar I had poured into it. So, you know, I came up with an event called the go ruck challenge, which was like fight club with backpacks and I'll meet you at 1 AM on a street corner and details not forthcoming. will be done when we're done. Right. I knew how to do that, build teams and Oh, oh, teach people how to overcome adversity. And, you know, the forensics on all of this, they might look agile, but that doesn't mean that it's not exceptionally hard. And I think the sooner that we embrace that, I mean, the status quo is hard too. embracing change is hard. It's just sort of, you know, what do we feel compelled to do? What do we need to do? And throughout the course of my life, I think the sooner that we realize that it's going to be hard, no matter what, there's, you have the freedom to be free. 
And so you get to sort of chart your own course, whatever that, whatever that might be. So That's what I got you. for now. So Fran, what, what drew you to be a leader? What do you want to contribute or influence or create in your time on earth? <laughs> oh, the meaning of meaning of life question. Um, <laughs> so uh, outside of the fact that I'm like super, super type A, like uh, 11 out of 10 on the type A scale, um, it's about, for me, it's about creating impact. Um, and you know, how do we, how do we as leaders impact and drive others to do the things that our mission needs us to do? Uh, and I talk really, that's where it starts. What, what are our goals? You know, we took goals are important, but what's our mission? What's our true value? What are we really trying to bring to our organizations and what are our organizations trying to bring to the world and society? And we as leaders have to figure out in my mind, where do we, where, where do we fit into that puzzle? Sometimes it's pulling people behind us. Other times it's pushing people along, but what's the impact? <clears throat> How, how do we set the conditions in our environment where people will jump on board and they'll, and they'll ascribe to what we want? And sometimes that's going to be by getting into the weeds and it's going to be by, you know, handling absolutely every little tactical detail, you know, and Jason, you know, talks a lot about this and, and he can go into it, but I mean, you know, he, Every product that GoRuck had to produce, you know, had to come from from somewhere in his mind. He had to understand every single component of that. But when do we get to focus on the strategy? And uh, you know, as leaders, oftentimes that balance becomes the most challenging part because I think that as leaders we have to go to the the point of impact and where are we most needed at this moment in time. When we talk about agility, that's really agility. We get a lot of people as leaders and you know, you'll hear CEOs or COOs will often say, oh, well, I'm the COO, I focus on the big picture. But if your company right now needs you to be focused on the small picture and the tactical level details, well, that's not where it's going to be the most effective application of time and resources as, as a leader in that organization. And that's really challenging. And so when I look at myself, when I look at the impact that I try to create, that I've always tried to create in the, organ in the organizations I've been a part of and what I am I work on today, where am I needed? And where do I bring the most value at this moment in time? Sometimes it might be in strategy and sometimes it might be in sitting down and getting on and, get, and creating that social media post, creating that pitch deck myself. Because no one else is no one else is going to do it. I've got to do it. There's a certain way it has to be done. So, it, so impact comes down to where do I need to be at this moment in time to achieve the most effect? So, Jason, same question to you. Why are you drawn to be a leader? And what do you want to contribute, influence, and create during your time on Earth? Well, I think it starts with something more than like a title. I mean, leader, CEO, whatever. I mean, I was happy as a staff sergeant in the army too, right? I was the lowest ranking guy in 10 special forces group there for a minute, you know? And, and that was, that was awesome um, it, because it tied in with my why. And so, you know, what did I want to do then? You know, serve America and, and that transition, I wanted revenge for 9-11 first and that transition to serve America and that transition to serve the guys to my left and the guys to my right. And, and that was a hell of a process in my own head to go through. And so I think the most important thing to do is to lead and examine life and think about what is your actual why? Do you want a title or do you want to do what you're compelled to do? Because a lot of people want a title because it's more money or more responsibility or you feel compelled to do that, but it's out of sync with who they actually are. And, and so I believe in the special forces way of life. And by that, I mean, you have real world people coming together. You, you care about the person to your left and the person to your right. You care about each other's families. It's tribal in nature. And you'll, you, you're there to push each other, challenge each other, support each other. And that's no different than in some ways sports teams that I played when I grew up. It's no different than what I want for neighborhoods all over America. I want people to be more active. I want people to know each other a little bit more. So in, in, at the end, uh, you know, stronger Stronger leaders, stronger community, stronger community, stronger nation. And, and that, that is my Northern star and, and my why. So it happens to lead me to 
this vessel of, of go rock and some of the other stuff that I do where ascribe any title that you want, but it, it, it's the, the goal is change. And it's not, you can't just go from zero to 400 million people. It's more like, Hey, you got to start where you can and, and, and create other people who can help you with that sphere of, of influence by what they do and, and through their actions, not just through their, not just through the, the lens of what seems to be popular in their day, which is, you know, getting online and doing stuff. That stuff is not really a true indicator of, of um, anything all that productive in my estimation. So Jason, you're CEO of Sandlot Technologies and, and GoRuck. And GoRuck is really an opportunity for people to do really hard things and to connect private citizens with the military experience and to be able to get to know military service members. So I had the opportunity and privilege last year of participating in a 24-hour Go Rock Heavy in New York City with um, in honor of the 20th anniversary of September 11th. And we had a recon Marine and an Army Ranger that spent this time with us. Those two gentlemen demonstrated so much agility and leadership and ultimately patience as they took 22 strangers got us together, and then got us to move about a thousand pounds of gear, 30 miles from Randall's Island all the way down to the World Trade Center. I have to say that was one of the best experiences of, of my life. And I'm looking forward to participating in another heavy this October, the Mogadishu Mile in Pittsburgh. So there's a couple mantras that GORUCK has that really resonate me with me personally and have moved me forward in my life. One of those is doing hard things makes me a better person, a softer person, a more empathetic and understanding person. But I'm really interested in hearing from you. What does that mean to you? And how do you embody that? How does it translate to business for you? And how does it translate into your leadership style? Yeah, I mean, the, the main takeaway is you don't get good. So let's start with an assumption, right? Assumption, that's a very important thing to do. Does, like, put a, who thinks that life's an easy place? Like, man, I got this figured out. This is easy. <laughs> who, who, belie who believes that? Like, is anyone raising their hand right now in the, in the thing? I'll bet you nobody, right? So let's start with the assumption that life is a hard place. I don't care if you're running a $300 million company or you're running a $50,000 a year company or anything in the middle, or you're in, I don't care who you are, pink, purple, polka dotted, black, white, gay, straight, male, female. We are united in this little experiment that we have called life and it's hard. So you don't get good at doing hard things by just doing easy things. It doesn't work like that. Nothing works like that in life. So if any pick any goal that you have in life, you don't just you can't just do easy stuff and 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 have yourself achieve that. It's incremental progress. It's it's um this is how you learn to be confident. This is how you learn about yourself. This is how you learn what you can do. This is how you learn what you cannot do. And so, you know, it's I, I do not wake up every morning and eat nails for breakfast and do all this stuff. And you know, everyone you're supposed to take, you know three hours of cold baths. I like scares me to death. I don't like heights. I don't like, I don't live on the tip of the spear, right. Is what I'm saying. I have done that for periods, but there's off cycles. The, the, the important thing is that you just have to kind of know that life is hard. We talked, I talked about this in the beginning. And then once you can accept that, like, what's the worst like, you're going to fail. Okay, great. You're going to succeed in this. Okay, great. It's actually the more that you succeed in stuff, oftentimes the more stress you get, especially if you're succeeding at something that you're not supposed to be doing. So go back to this examined life, right? Some stoic philosophy stuff creeping into all this, but lead an examined life. And is it worth it? You know, you have to know yourself in this. And to me, the only way that I've ever found where I could get to know myself better was in times of adversity. Because the, 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 the self that I meet when it's me on a beach and I'm supposed to be relaxing and there's some guy with a 
sippy drink and he'll bring it like I'm just supposed to be sitting there and there's this pressure to relax me at my all time worst. Right. <laughs> so, you know, that said, if I'm it, it's like if you don't feel good, put 20 or 30 pounds on your back, literally put 20 or 30 pounds on your back. Go for a walk, a rock, call it five miles, call it 12, call it 20. Come back and tell me if you feel better than you did when you left. And I will guarantee you that you will. And if you don't, then do it again and, and, and do it until you feel better. And it's like, how do we align mental health and physical health and social health and, and all of those things? But we got to be more active ultimately. And so do hard things, learn about yourself, lead an examined life, figure out what works for you and what doesn't. And once you're in a better spot, it makes it a lot easier for others to be around you and to you know, either follow you or work with you or manage you, right? I mean, great leaders also want to be led. So I, I would add here too that, you know, there's this component of people put in their mind that if I do these things, life will be easy. Oh, if I make X amount of money, life will be easy. If I, you know, if, if I can just, you know, close this deal, life will be easy. You know, we always tend to think like, oh, well, we're going to hit this, this benchmark and all of a sudden, everything will be easy. And that's, that's not reality. I mean, the reality is, is that we have to figure out how to, how to do hard better, because when we hit those, those benchmarks, when we do those things, something is going to get more complex. We're going to up the standard. We're going to up our, our next goal is now going to be in front of us where we've said, yep, okay, now I can, I've achieved this. And now I'm going to push myself to go to the next thing. And when real true, leadership and real true elite performers are always looking for that next thing only the difference is they're doing hard better they're every time they hit that benchmark they've set a new bar they've set a new standard and then they're thinking okay well now i know i can do that and i can now do something harder at a better level at a higher level but it's people who look back and are constantly saying oh well if i do this it'll get easy if i do this it'll get easy that's not reality and they're never going to achieve those goals because they're always looking for the easy way out. They're looking for the path, a, a, a path that doesn't exist. I think that's great. I mean, there's there's an, another mantra, Jason, that you talk about a lot on your podcast, Glorious Professionals, especially when you talk about Selection and Sandlot Jacks, which are two big events that you do um, every year. And that's respect for the athlete. So although you're asking these people to do not just hard things, but I would say super hard things, that premise and that mindset of asking people to do really hard things and pushing them and demanding them, yet at the same time, showing them ultimate respect. Can you just describe how you implement that and execute that? Because I think that translates so directly into business and how we need to behave as leaders. Well, I got this from, it started with Drill Sergeant Hester on an airfield at Fort Benning as I was graduating. And he had been really hard on us. And we all came to love and respect this man. And, and um, he gave us his talk on the airfield, which was like, you know, it's, it's before graduation, it's big dog and pony show. But he's like, you know, I respect you all. You all chose to be here. And I respect you for that decision. And I was hard on you because I wanted you to stay alive. And it like makes me get goosebumps now, even just recalling it. And that was 2000, that was 2004. So we're 19 years ago, this happened and it still gives me goosebumps. And so like, that's how he carried himself. And it's how he conducted himself. And there were times he, he got a little, got a little hot headed, but that's all right. Um, and so, you know, I think that you can cross a line with people if you forget that they're human beings as well. And, you know, you, you want to, you have to have some empathy. And I don't I mean, the greatest teacher of empathy for me was failure, whether it was, you know, relationships or whether it was various phases of, you know, training where I almost didn't make it or it was, you know, business stuff or it was having kids and just you know, like, man, some mornings it's like I am just a total fail failure this morning, and you realize that you know anybody else out there might be going through that right this second. You just don't know. People got to put on their 
people got to put on their makeup and their camouflage, you know, to kind of deal with the world. And, and so it's uh, the, the easiest way, it's kind of like got to take this question in, in sequence. The easiest way to push people is first off to know them or to know who they are or to make sure that they actually want to be there or to make sure that you're aligned culturally with values or you're, you share the same mission. Like you need to get on the same page with people before you just start barking or else you're just a dog, man. You know, like get on the same page with people, listen first or do something, go to lunch with somebody, but you can't just come in and, and be like, you know, I'm a high performer. Follow me. It's, it's, it's off putting. I don't care who it is. And so once you have some degree, we call it rapport is the big thing they test in, in the army and in special forces training specifically. It's like build and maintain rapport with the, do you play well with others, with your team? Because if you can't play well with your team, you're probably not going to play well with your team of Iraqis that you have very little in, in, in common with, or your team of Afghans that you have very little in common with. You have to be able to build and maintain rapport. And, and that's a, the, the human terrain is absolutely the, the hardest thing. And at my level, the hard part is, is that when it's not just two or three of you in a room, like it was way back when, it's like, you have to surround yourself with people that can, that, that know you or that speak the same language as you do, or that respond to the same things, or you have to adapt your style to get the most out of people. This is all very hard. This is all very challenging. This is a lot harder than running the next 100, 100K ruck run or the 50 mile or wherever. Like sometimes it's, we want to do hard things, got it. But sometimes we, we gravitate towards the hard things that are easy for us instead of the hard things that are hard for us. And a lot of times, instead of, you know, grinding something out or pulling another all nighter, you need to maybe ask someone to go to lunch with you. <laughs> You know, and, and I think each of us has to sort of navigate that journey for, for ourselves because, you know, in, in your specific case, to tie it back to, to the Go Ruck Challenge, you have these adaptive cadre who, who are trained to, to break down a team that, by the way, has volunteered to be there and has chosen to be there, which is the selection process. So choose your people wisely that you surround yourself with that are, are on your team and culture matters more than than anything else so you all kind of self-selected to be at this really hard thing and then i don't care who it is there's there's always this kind of um these big boundaries up at the beginning of anything when you introduce a new person onto a team it changes the whole dynamic you're back to who's who in the zoo there's all sorts of butt sniffing going on and what are the characteristics of everything that everyone's strengths and weaknesses are and do i play well with them or how do I have to adapt myself on this team that I find myself on? And so, you know, physicality and shared forced communication, if you will, right? This, this greases the tracks. People isolating and going over here, that's toxic. That's probably the most toxic thing because we all get in our, our heads and you start assuming stuff. So you got to kind of force people to come together. And then you're just in this big, giant human experiment of, of leadership. It, that's Jason one brought of the, the benefits really of of I guess kind of leveraging the tools within predictive indexes. We know right away what what are someone's natural behaviors and what their drives, needs, and motivators are, which allows the team to accelerate to getting to know each other together, as well as the leader really understanding who's on their team and what they're about. So, Fran, do you want to dive into that a little bit? Yeah, I, I want to bring up some of that Jason mentioned though about choice for, first because he, he he mentioned choice, you know, we and we forget so many times. I think in in a lot of things we do in life that like we have a choice in almost everything that we get to do. And what happens is we choose things like, oh, I I, I choose to go to the gym, or I I choose to have this job, or you know, I choose to be in this situation right now. And then we get there, and then immediately it, it becomes, oh, I have to. Oh man, I got to do this three mile run. Oh, I've got to go into this meeting. Oh, I've got to produce this report. But when we can transition that and that have to to get to, and remember that we chose to be here. So why not do the very best job that we can do and fully embrace the opportunity? It changes the whole mindset and our perspective on how we 
perform because now we're not in the back seat. Now we're in the driver's seat. People come to work in on our special forces team and, you know, and they would say, oh, you know, I don't want to do this. OK, well, here, let's remember that you volunteered three times to be here. You, know, you volunteered to come in the army. You volunteered to go to selection and be selected. And every day that you wake up and you put your uniform on and you put your green beret on and you walk into this team room, you volunteered to be here. So for someone to walk in and not expect themselves first to put 100 percent and embrace everything that they're doing to the best of their ability, that's where we that's the start of the path to failure. And when, when we can remember that in everything that we do, then we don't do the things that Jason's talking about. Okay, I came to this event, but now there's 300 people over here and I'm standing off to the side. I already made the choice to be here. Get in, jump in, say, hi, I'm this person. Let's do this together. And then that's going to be the growth. That's going to be the embracing of it. Otherwise, it's a missed opportunity. And we have to re remind ourselves, then why do we choose to be there in the first place? When that's the attitude, I think, that builds like the greatest organizations because it's just full of people who just want to get after it because the first thing that they remember every day is I woke up and I want to do this. So let's so do to it. Christine's point, though, I think the more that you're able to kind of find the the right kind of people for your culture or aptitude or whatever your kind of selection process is that you're looking for. I mean, you know, sales teams are different than IT folks is kind of a really simple analogy. And and you have to know your own culture first to know the type of person that you're looking for. I mean, the selection process tests you against very specific traits and qualities. And, you know, the, the more that you're able to accelerate that, like, Life is a, is, is a process of selections. It's, it's, it's just what it is. And the more that we're able to apply that to, to anything, to business, to whatever it might be, people are everything and culture will trump strategy any day of the, of, of the week. So the more that you're able to accelerate who comes into your team and who comes into your universe, the, the, the greater your strategic advantage will be. You want to add anything, Fran? I I hundred percent agree. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I mean that that's that that selection process, you know, is is where it starts. You know, I think a lot of times too, we think about like, okay, well, I've got to get that job. Uh, I've got to I've got to you know, in special operations, we would say, you know, well, you got to get through selection. You know, I talked to a lot of professional athletes. We talk about the draft. You know, and they'll say, okay, well, I I, I was drafted. Okay, great. Well, but that's just the start. Getting the job is the is day one. That gets you a seat at the table, but now every single day that we're there, we have to actually earn our our right to be there. We have to earn our our ability to perform at a high level because we haven't done anything yet. Being being there is the start. Being selected is the start. Getting the job is the start. Now it's about execution. So as, as you're looking to bring these people together and, and you're building this community and this culture, what, what do you think are the are the the critical elements? I mean, Jason, you mean, do you want to go first or to uh, elements to building community? What what needs to be included and in, and what do people sometimes forget about? I think community building is probably the hardest thing you can possibly do. You're asking to to align people against uh task, mission, and purpose. So a why, you know, it, it dates back to sort of tribal roots where you would share food and defense. I mean, think about that for just a second. That is a, that is the sort of avatar of a community because you literally have to be in it together. And culturally, nobody shares food anymore. And basically, unless you're fighting the fight, nobody shares defense. I mean, I get it. There's a, there's a, a U.S. military but there's nothing on the line for people at home short of, you know, outsider attacks like 9-11, which I will never like downgrade the importance of protecting against that. But we don't feel that in our daily lives. So how do you get people to align in the real world? And let's also go back to assumptions. There's no such thing as an online community. The word has been stolen and it, it's the, it does not apply. 
So yes, I get it. The Facebook community. Do you think that people that were living in a hunter gatherer society, a tribal society treated each other the way they do on Reddit or Facebook or whatever? Absolutely not. Because there's, there's a dehumanization that happens when it's screens only or virtual only or text only or whatever. It's, there's behavior that is just horrific in its own right. And it's as if there's no consequences. There are massive consequences when you have to share food and defense. So in terms of community building, it, it requires things like you know, consistency and communication and constantly being um, accessible to people. And you know, for, for us, I'll give you how it translates to us. So you know, 99% of our business is equipment sales. We sell rucksacks, sandbags, shoes, apparel, take, take your pick, right? This is a far cry from what it was back in the day when it was like 50-50 events and gear. And, you know, we, were, we, we put on a thousand events a year for some type of scale of perspective. And it's still 99% uh, gear and, and, and equipment sales. And so to go back to sort of special forces roots, the, the difference between the Green Berets and say the SEALs is, or Delta Force or you know whatever, is the SEALs and Delta Force, they operate with other SEALs and other Delta Force operators. They, they do unilateral strikes. So you are only really ever working with people that are the same as you. I mean, you all went through these ultimate crucibles of selection and, and, and like the selection that happens in the team room every day is, is its own thing too. If you just stop performing or, you know, look at someone the wrong way and, and they don't, they think you're negative for the team. They just throw your, they throw your stuff in the hall. You're gone. Like go find a different job. Right. Green berets are different. And by the way, there's a, there's a place for both of these. I just, I'm, I just want to like frame this conversation. Green Berets work by, with, and through partner forces. What that means is that right after 9-11, Green Berets, famed in, in the horse soldier stories, went into the boneyard of the Soviet empire, linked up with the Northern Alliance, and in 60 days, they had defeated the Taliban and, and instituted a new president of, of Afghanistan, right? So they did that because you're able to work with the locals with a much smaller footprint you have to align against what's the why. The why there was not as strong as it was on the team. Like the team is you'll do anything for each other. You expand that, that influence, it's, it's harder, right? Because now you're working with, with Afghans that don't like these other tribes in Afghanistan, but you need this tribe in order to show you where the bad guys are because you can never conceivably do it yourself. Just ask the Russians, right? So the thing is, in, in this case, is community building you know, a community of two is still a community. It's a, it's a good start, right? It's better than alone and afraid and, you know, in, in, in Ma's basement playing video games, which too many kids are doing these days, right? That's not a community at all, right? So in community, you have to, you have to kind of have empathy. You have to have consistent behavior. You have to continually align on, on whys. And if you want to grow it, you have to be nice. You have to encourage the people around you and you have to turn them into your champions. Because if you don't, and, and you make them upset, then they just spread that toxic, nah, he's a terrible person, or insert whatever, you know, slight that they might do. So it's, it's the human terrain. And to go back to the, the first theme, it's, it's really hard. And I would say it's the hardest thing, and it never ends, and it can be taken away like that after all the time in, in the world that you spent building something just by treating someone poorly. It's also the most rewarding. Mm -hmm. Fran, is there anything you want to add to how, what does it take to create a community? Sure. I, I think it comes down to, to shared purpose. Uh, it, comes, it comes down to the unifying vision, unifying mission. Why, why are we here? I think nobody, you know, uh, nobody wakes up every day and kind of like gets in their car and drives to work and goes, I'm going to do a really crappy job today. Yeah, you know, everybody wakes up and genuinely, by and large, wants to do a good job in in where they are and what they're doing. But what builds community and what become what builds sustainable organizations over the long term is the buy-in that there's 
that there's a unifying mission that they're going there to be a part of and that they're a valuable contributor to it. When people see that, when they understand that, when they're empowered to, to see where their con individual contributions fit into the, lar the larger, broader, and state and mission, then they jump in. And that can then they understand where they fit in in that community because again, like nobody wants to be a part of a community that they don't feel they fit into either. They want to be a part of groups and communities where they feel like they have a voice, they feel like they have a purpose, and they feel like they're valued. So our job primarily when building organizations and building these these communities is to show people and get them to understand here's your contribution. This is why it matters. This is why we value it. And this is the result of what you do here and what you bring to it this every day. And that doesn't matter, again, if you're a business, if you're a sports team, if you're in the military, you know, whatever you're doing, that value that people understand is what brings them in and keeps them into a community. So, can, Fran, can you share, like, how do you create and drive a culture of continuous learning and support learning agility in, in the organizations that you work with or within your organization? Uh, two, two, two things, and they're kind of surrounded around the same theme. Um, constant, I, I talk about humility and I talk about curiosity. And, and I believe that those two things are closely aligned. And humility being our ability to look internally and self-assess ourselves honestly. And, 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 and I use the term honestly in, for a reason, because a lot of times we'll say, yeah, you know, I, I did okay on that. Okay. Well, did I do okay? Or did I suck? You know, like let's, let's really truly honestly assess where we're at, but then also understand what are we assessing ourselves against? Are we assessing ourselves against others, against ourselves? You know, I always, I always kind of talk about let's assess against yourself first. Because we've got to be true to ourselves, and that that's humility. But the second part is is this curiosity. You know, do we are we always asking the question, "Can it be done better?" And I think that anytime we look at something and we say it can't be done better, we're probably not demonstrating the level of humility that's required for that situation. Because I believe everything can always be done better. We just haven't thought about that angle. We haven't thought about that other way. We haven't thought about that small thing that could possibly be done better. Very rarely do we do something and we're like, well, I executed that perfectly. <laughs> Let's high five. You know, but we have to maintain the curiosity to consistently try to think about ways in which we can improve. There's, there's a difference between first and second and, you know, first and third and like, second and fifth, right? And that difference, if we talk about for a second, like elite athletes, uh, Olympic athletes, that difference is often very, very minor. But what that difference is, is that the people who stand on the podium every day when they finish their work for the day, they're asking themselves one question. What else can I do? What didn't I do? What should I be doing? People who finish fifth, sixth, tenth are finishing their work for the day and they're going home and they're saying, I worked hard today. I did what I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. When we can consistently put in the back of our mind the question of what else can I do? Now we're really talking about driving our organizations forward, thinking with a performance mindset and creating an adaptable organization that's always evolving because there's always something else we can do. But you should also, as I've learned recently, go to sleep for a reasonable <laughs> seven, seven to eight hours, right? Because I mean, otherwise I'm, I'm brutally nasty and sarcastic and cranky and I'm not, I'm not yeah. a good person to be around. So uh, Jason, what, you know, what What do you do at, at GORUCK to drive that continuous learning and support learning agility in, in your organization? Well, I think the first step is to find the right people that actually want to be agile and that have an appetite for it because it's a, it's a cultural thing. Um, to be 
agile, you have to be willing to change. To be willing to change, you have to be willing to take risks. Mm -hmm. To be willing to take risks, you have to be capable of, of accepting that you might fail. To, to accept that you might fail means you have the confidence of having succeeded in other things that have given you that confidence because you know if if it's this kind of vicious cycle right and so you have to know yourself and you have to have been out and about and tried hard things and and, and all these themes that are all so interconnected but ultimately a lot of people are not suited for being highly adaptable and they, they must frankly just be led through that with, with greater and then then you give them a different left and right limits and you say okay i need you to execute on this so teams need different types of people to be agile and i would just say at a really personal level i just get bored if everything is the same and i know that weatherman up there is the exact same as me on that front and so i, th I think part of my challenge is how to be sometimes less do less because sometimes you've got to, you know, you got to let the, the the wine air out just a little bit, right? At least that's what they say. I'm not really much of a wino, but they say you got to like, you know, let it breathe. And mm -hmm. so instead of having ADHD and going from new thing to new thing to try to be adaptable because you want that to be your culture and that becomes like the the, the dog that you're hunting for your organization, it's it's more like what's the actual plan here and how do you align a team and people uh, around it and this has taken me a long time a long time to even start to ask those questions because we've been at times too agile and have have failed and, and and not failed like oh we went out of business like failed to like we've sacrificed the gift of what were of our potential because we weren't aligned and so what's the point of being agile if it's just me out doing something, it's that's that's not what leadership or team is. And, and if you don't point all the guns in the right direction, like you're not gonna, you're 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 sacrificing your your potential and your capability and the opportunity itself. So yes, you have to find the right people, and then you have to you have to pick the right fights. And it's a cultural. You go through something and, and you hot wash it. You lead an examined life for yourself. And you bring your team along with that. And we call it murder boarding at Go Ruck. And we have lots of, you know, like we like to take from the military and all that stuff. But a murder board is like you bring something in. And this goes back to sort of respect the athlete or respect the person as well. It's all about the thing. Like whoever's idea it is, let's talk about this thing. Let's not talk about ownership. Let's not talk about, you know, even feelings. It's like this thing. Why is this zipper here? Or why, how is someone supposed to register for this thing if, like, who is the point of contact? Or, you know, what is the purpose of this shoe? I mean, it is ruthless. And if people don't have the freedom to speak up and stuff like that, you get too many people that just kind of, like, are, don't want to be confrontational or whatever the case may be in their own way, but they have great thoughts. So it's a cultural thing. It comes back to the people and making sure that, the, the, the agility that you're after is not for its own sake, it's for the betterment of the organization. Yeah, I mean, I would I would say we see a lot of that in business where whoever designed the process or currently owns the process or wants to control the process is so busy defending it that we can't get to the point where we could actually make it work better, you know, or be more helpful or add more value. Like you see people get into these super defensive positions about what they created or what they put in place for the sake of, I guess, protecting their ego instead of saying, okay, how maybe I should take some input and some feedback from my colleagues and teammates and, and be willing to say it worked when we did it, but now we can make it better. The time has changed, the technology has changed, our business has changed. And quite honestly, that's what I spend a lot of my time doing, talking people down. Like it's it's my tagline sometimes at cocktail parties is I make a living off of people behaving badly at work because I truly that's that's honestly at the end of the day why I get paid. If everybody behaved and showed up in a, an appropriate way and wanted to work together, I don't really necessarily know that I would have a company or a job. But anyway, well, internally, you have an attitude of. Good. Sorry. 
So I was just going to say, you have to get buy-in. Yes. And he goes, like, do you play well with others? I mean, it's great. You did something in isolation and then you surprise someone who's supposed to be your peer with like, hey, here's this great thing I did. I spent six months on it. He's like, well, that doesn't work because of this. Now you're in a huge power struggle that's just going to toxically burn stuff to the ground. So yeah. it goes back to, do you play well with others? Do you have, are you able to communicate with each other? If not, why not? Right. I mean, my, my favorite three traits in anyone that's going to be on my team is happy, friendly, and helpful. And if you're not those three things, and I don't think those three things are really all that hard, then you're not, you're not going to get to play with me. That's, that's just how, how it is. And, and someone doesn't always have to lose for someone else to win. You know, I think we forget about that too. And we, we talked about community and we talked about teams and we, you know, effective, highly effective teams don't care who gets the credit. They don't care about, you know, you, oh, well, well, if you win, I have to lose, right? So then therefore I can't let you win. So I have to defend this. You know, they're unwilling to sit there and say, well, I, look, hey, I had a good idea. I took this product, you know, 50% of the way. And I didn't think about those other four things that you did. But the reality is, is if I hadn't gotten it to here, you wouldn't have thought about those four things. So like, now let's make it better. That's cool. You know, instead it becomes like, oh, you know, you're attacking my product. Okay, well, that, no, we're trying to make it better. And when we can think in those terms that you know, we can all win, then we will be more effective. So Fran, what was something that you had to learn in this past year in order to move your business forward or to achieve a goal? Oh, patience. <laughs> um, uh, I, I mean, for me, you know, as Jason joked, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I like action, you know, I want to see results. I want things to happen now. Um, you, I think that having patience and having um, a strat, a defined strategy, and it becomes really important. You know, one of the taglines that I use specifically on on the podcast is how you prepare today determines success tomorrow. And often, what happens is we become fixated on that last word tomorrow. Uh, and then, and then, even though we know it, you know, we'll forget about well, what has to happen today. Uh, we set goals. You know, I, I, I've I've set goals. I've I've set a vision for where I want to be and what we want to build. Not only in in the various companies that I'm working in, but I think the most important thing is the standard that we set for ourselves every day. You know, if we can create a standard that allows us to build upon. Uh, uh, our achievements every single day, then we'll get to our goal. When I'm too focused on the goal, when I'm looking down the road too far, then I will forget about those little things, those little conversations, those little meetings. Jason talked about go to lunch with somebody, build that relationship. You know, it's I can pick up my, I can pick up the phone on somebody on my team and and you know, bombard them with all the tasks that they might have or have not achieved. But maybe the most important thing in the long run today is that I do ask them to go have a coffee or ask them how their kids are. Uh, and that, I think, it becomes hard when you're results oriented and you want things now. But that comes back to kind of how we started this is where's the where is the point of impact that I need to be as a leader in my organization at this moment in time, regardless of where I think we should or need to be right now? So Jason, would you like to answer that question? What did you have to learn in the past year in order to achieve a business goal or move your business forward? So we put on this big festival last year, we mentioned in the, the intro called Sandlot Jacks, which is basically positioned as the South by Southwest of cities. That is not an unambitious goal, right? And it's meant to bring in thought leaders from all over the world and combine a lot of different kinds of people that are not just in one niche. So all different kinds of fitness, fit talks, like position is TED style talks. There's, you know, um, live music, there's uh, training, training classes, if, anything from yoga to sandbags, there's an obstacle course that's there, but ultimately it's, it's people coming together in a, in an outdoor space in Florida on the river. And it's awesome, right? Cause people make the party. The, that, that's the context for I have a Rolodex and I need to call people and ask for help. That's in, in, I think that's universally true of everyone. 
And it's probably the people in your Rolodex that when you see their name, you don't think like, Ugh. like if you don't really want to call someone, then focus on someone else. I mean, and, and, and make that list if, if you need something, right? And, and by need, I mean, it's not just transactional, but reach out to people and say, hey, I need your help. I'm doing this thing. Can we align on this? And, and Fran's a perfect case in, in, in this, Weatherman. It was like, hey, man, I need, I need your help on all of this stuff down here. And who do you know? And who can you invite? And sure, bring the podcast. And, you know, it was good for him, too. Timing was good. You know, he got to interview a lot of people. And a lot of people came through. And like, he's a pro. So it made me look good because he was there. And we're all buddies from the same, you know, same group. I mean, I guess the point is, is we, we, we're always chasing new stuff. And, you know, if you transition this to, to business, we all have a Rolodex, go f- filter through your LinkedIn people. So it's, it's like the easiest way to do it. But we also have a Rolodex in life. And those people that we care the most about are probably the ones that we need to also reach out to every once in a while. And, you know, sometimes that transitions into date night or sometimes that transitions into whatever it might be. But like these, these fundamentals are, there's nothing hard about them. Like we need other people. It's okay to say we need other people and we have to just behave like that. Mm -hmm. So we're going to end with a little bit of fun and some rapid fire questions. So I'm, we're going to go, so Fran will answer and then Jason, and we're going to see how many we can get through in the next couple minutes. What is your favorite calisthenic exercise? (laughs) Uh, uh, I like to run. Well, rucking and burpees. What is something that you believe other people think, but you find it insane, Fran? Uh, Burpees. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Checklists and to-do task lists. I'm just, I have a little bit of it, but you know, you make a list of 25 things and three of them matter. And you know what those three are. Like you don't need a list. Yeah. What is the book you have given most as a gift? Um, when when character, uh, when character Was King uh, by Peggy Noonan about uh, Ronald Reagan. Jason? Man, Sir, Man Search for Meaning, Victor Frankl. What's your favorite film, Fran? Oh. Pulp Fiction. <laughs> uh, okay, so he said Pulp Fiction. Um, ooh, favorite film. That's tough. Um, Desperate uh, Housewives, maybe something yeah, like that. Like, yeah, on, make a decision there. I like that. The Real Housewives is is more. Um, damn, you know what? Honestly, I'll give you the best sequel because that's the only thing coming to my mind. The best sequel ever is Top Gun. So, and that's and nobody can argue with me about that. Terminator <laughs> Two is also up there as a as yeah. A, I would I, I go with sequel, Jason. So. Definitely Terminator Two over Top Gun. Okay, what is a quote that you live your life by or refer to often for inspiration? Um, if you were there in the very beginning, uh, Jason asked me what was behind me on my on my wall, and it's it's a picture of George Washington, and it says first first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen. Those to whom much is given, much is expected. What do you believe to be true, even though you can't prove it? Uh, leaders lead from the front. There's no such thing as leading from behind. Jason. So I think a lot about what defines a healthy life. And if you look at the three kind of components of health, I think about physical health is kind of the, the foundation in some ways. Mental health gets all the press, like mental health, mental health. And that's kind of like spiritual health and well-being are, are the same. Put them at the top of the pyramid. But my belief is that social health is the glue to all of it. So we're social creatures and it's it's the most important thing to either because if you feel good about the people who are around you and you actually spend time with them, you know, you start to prioritize them like you would your, your family or your friends or stuff instead of just, you know, checklists and tasks and goals and people telling you need to do more push-ups to get healthy. So sh- social health is the most yeah. important component of our health. Interesting point to what you're saying is that people that are more likely to stay at their current job, it's because they have at least one or two friends at the company that they look forward to seeing every day and they feel connected. 
They feel like somebody actually cares about them when they show up. So on our final note, Fran, how do people find you? Where are you online or how do you want to be connected with? Yeah, you can uh, follow me on LinkedIn, uh, Fran Rachopi on Instagram, uh, Fran Rachopi is the same thing, or my website is uh, either fr6, uh, frsix.com for my company, and then the Jedberg podcast is my podcast. So it's the 30 plus podcast platforms. Check us out on YouTube. Everything, all social media is at Jedberg podcast or jedbergpodcast.com. Jason, how do people find you? You can find Go Ruck at all the things at just G O R U C K. And I'm not super active personally on social media, but I'm, uh, if you send me a note, I usually get back to you. So um, I'd love to hear from any of you. It's Jason J McCarthy at Instagram, or you can find me on LinkedIn. I might even be connected to, uh, to, to, to weatherman up there so if you're a friend with him you can come and find me too <laughs> we do a lot jason and i do a lot together so yeah, <laughs> if you find one of us you'll inevitably find the other one <laughs> i just want to say thank you so much to the two of you again this has been an epic hour in my life for me so i just send you both tremendous love and gratitude for dedicating the time to be here with me and with the people that are in my circle and that I care about very much. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Have a great one. Have Thank a great you. day.